Um, man, every, every week during the, the course of this sermon series, um, when the sermon series started about hearing from the Lord, um, it's one of those things that when you, when, you, when you speak or when you preach, you begin to realize that whatever the Lord wants to do, He has to do in you first. And we're having a sermon series right now called Frequency. It's about hearing from the Lord. And it's one of those things the Lord's not just going to let me skate by <laughs> to deliver to you guys a message. And so when the sermon series started, I began to pray, Lord, you know, it's good for me to have it like a plan laid out week by week. But the Lord said, I'm not going to give you the full picture for this sermon series. I'm going to give it to you week by week by week. And so every week, I've just been coming before the Lord to say, Lord, what do you, what do you want to say to me for new life this week? And this message in particular, last week we talked about how, some of the ways that the Lord speaks, and I talked through that. And this week, I felt the Lord wanted to continue that in a sense, but not according to the way that I thought. See, last week, um, I said I wasn't going to preach for 50 minutes, and I was good for my word. I preached 55. <laughs> and um, I have really encouraging people around me. And um, my wife, this morning, right before I was going to get up to, to speak, she said, i got to go to the bathroom. I should probably do that before you get up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so that encouragement let me know, hey, cut it off a little bit quicker this time, long-winded boy. Um, but as I was th thinking about this week, the Lord directed me to Luke chapter 6. If you have your scriptures and you want to turn there, it will be on the screen behind us. And I, I thought from last week, since I had prepared like 17 ways that I've experienced the Lord speaking, and I got to like six of them, that I would probably just continue like giving you guys stories of the ones that I didn't finish last week. But as I began to pray, I felt the Lord say, no, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to start on a different pattern this week, and I want you to start in Luke chapter 6. And so I began to read through Luke chapter 6, and I read through the whole chapter and, and there was nothing that immediately stood out about hearing from the Lord. And so I just began to say, Lord, I, I don't have a full understanding. I felt the Lord say, read it again. So I began to read it again, and this story stuck out to me. And as I began to read through the scriptures, as the Lord sort of stepped me through this message step by step, this message in particular came with a sense of trembling. Uh, at different times in my walk with the Lord... Uh, the Lord would al alert me, I have something I want to say to you, and I would, I would begin to tremble. Like I would, you, you know, like when you're on the verge of um, like uh, shivering, it's, it's like that sense, and I, I would, but I wasn't cold, and I would, I would feel that in, 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 in my chest, and, I, and it was like a, a marker, I want to say something to you, and you need to separate yourself and prepare to hear from me. And this has happened on multiple occasions, but this message in particular came in a very similar manner and when the Lord began to walk me through this, the, the beauty of what I felt like he was saying to me for new life and for myself uh, brought me to tears. And I believe this morning that, that this message has been given because the Lord wants to do something in our midst. And, and it's not trivial and it's not trite. It's not um, flippant. I believe that the Lord wants to, by His Spirit, have a profound impact in our hearts collectively and individually because He wants to use us for His work in His kingdom. We, we say to see the Lord build the kingdom, He wants to use us. And there's only one way that He gets us to the point that we're usable for His kingdom and for His glory, and that's by transforming our hearts. So last week we talked a little bit about how some of the ways that the Lord speaks, and I told you last week, that's not exhaustive, but just some of the ways, because he'll use anything. This week, I want to talk a little bit about why the Lord chooses to speak to us, because I believe the Lord gave me just a small glimpse, just a tiny glimpse into a bit of his motivation for speaking to us. So I want us to jump in to Luke chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1. This is what it says. It says, On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields... His disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him? And he said to them, The Son of Man... 
is Lord of the Sabbath. Father, would you make your presence known in our midst this morning? Would you speak to our hearts and would you begin, Lord, to to transform us according to your presence and according to your spirit, to do in us, Lord, whatever is in your heart? You see, Jesus is comparing this thing that just happened to eating the grain on the Sabbath to the story of David eating the bread of the presence in the Old Testament. That story is in 1 Samuel. We're going to look at that in just a second. But when, when I read this story, there was something that stuck out to me in the midst of it. One, it said that they were hungry. They were plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath, and they were rubbing them in their hands. But this was seen as a transgression against the Sabbath day because in the Old Testament, you could not harvest grain on the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath was a representation that it took God six days to create the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. And then we are given the same opportunity to rest. And it's amazing to me that whether you're good or bad, righteous or evil, at the end of the day, the Lord has given us both an opportunity to rest in the night. It's, it's a gift from him, and it's a picture for us that we need rest. And so the, the Pharisees are looking at Jesus' disciples and Jesus looking for an a, a opportunity to accuse them of some wrongdoing. Because they, in their religious mind, they can't come to terms with this man who seems to always buck against their rules, yet at his hand... Blind people are receiving their sight, and deaf people are receiving their hearing, and dead people are being brought back to life. And they cannot reconcile in their mind how this man doesn't fit all their traditions, yet the power of God is with him. And so they're looking for any opportunity they can to say, this man's wicked, you shouldn't follow him. And they find what they think is an opportunity. They see Jesus and his disciples coming across the field, and his disciples, because they're hungry, are plucking grain They're rubbing the husk off the grain and they're eating it because they're hungry. And Jesus is saying to them, have you not read the scriptures? The scriptures give a testimony that say that the rules aren't always what you think that they are. And if you knew who I was, you would know that we haven't transgressed any law. Because Jesus is saying to them, I am the one who is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's saying, do you not recognize my authority? If I'm the one who created the Sabbath, do you not think I can give my disciples the opportunity to eat on it, to pick grain on it? You don't recognize who it is that stands in front of you. And not only do you not recognize who it is that stands in front of you, but your, your tradition and your, your scriptures, the way that you're seeking to judge me, you don't even know or understand them. And I'm telling you, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I'm Lord of the Sabbath. He's saying, I have authority over this day to do with this day what I want to do. But it's also, don't miss this, y'all, it's also given to those that are His. His authority over the Sabbath transferred to His disciples receiving food. And He's saying, because they're with me and they are like me, I'm giving to them what ought to be holy. You see, the Sabbath is set apart for holiness. That rest is set apart for holiness. And Jesus is saying, because of my authority, I'm giving to them what actually should be out of bounds. Because I don't give dogs what's holy, and I don't cast pearls before pigs. But when you're with me, there's nothing that can be withheld from you. There's nothing that can be withheld from you. I love the imagery that Jesus gives of the story in the Old Testament. We're going to look at it again in a second, but it's important that you have a little bit of understanding of of what Jesus is talking about when when David comes before the tabernacle in the Old Testament in, in 1 Samuel. You see, the tabernacle was set up to be this mobile place for the glory of God to dwell in the midst of his people. And they built the tabernacle under Moses, but after even after Moses had gone, the tabernacle would move from place to place. And when Israel became a place of living in the land, they set up the tabernacle at Shiloh. And so it had this outer court that was these linen drapes. And then when you passed into the, to, to the, into the outer court, there was a, a place, an altar there, a place of sacrifice where the people would come to make atonement for their sin. They would bring their sheep and their oxen, their pigeons, their turtle doves, and they would have sacrifice and burn those offerings there before the Lord to make atonement for their sin. The priests would offer those gifts, but then they would enter into the tabernacle itself, which was a curtained-off area. It was a separate area, and the entry place into the tabernacle was called the holy place. And inside the holy place, there were three separate pieces of, of furniture. The first was 
this table that held the bread of the presence. It was a golden table. It was about two and a half feet tall or three feet tall. And it was made of acacia wood and overlaid with solid gold. And on that table were 12 loaves of bread that signified the 12 tribes of the people. But they were set in two piles of six loaves each. And in between those two, two piles of bread was wine. And on top of those two piles of bread was frankincense. Also, you had this altar of incense that was kept burning before the Lord and the candlestick, or the, the uh, what do they call that? In the menorah, right? And these three, these three pieces of furniture stayed in the holy place, and there was a curtain that separated the holy place from what they called the most holy place. And inside the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of God remained. It's where Moses would enter into to speak to the Lord. It's where the priest would enter once a year to make atonement for the people of Israel. And, and he only once a year and only after serious, intense preparation would he enter into that place. In the book of Hebrews in chapter 9, if you want to read it later, I would encourage you to do that. It says that the tabernacle is a copy of heavenly things. That it was put here and that it contains imagery that's important for us to know. And that the, the holy place where those three places are, those three pieces of furniture are... They represent the age that we live in right now. And Jesus is saying, this bread of the presence, it was called the bread of the presence, remained in the tabernacle and it was only to be eaten by the priest. Because what happened was, every Sabbath day, the priest would enter into the holy place after they had washed themselves and consecrated themselves. And they had specific garments that they had to wear that were garments that were considered holy to the Lord. You couldn't enter willy-nilly into the presence of the Lord without there being consequences. We find that out in Numbers when Aaron's sons offer strange fire before the Lord. And it says that fire came from the Holy of Holies and consumed them on the spot. You don't play with the holiness of God. You don't enter into holy places defiled. You cannot walk into the presence of God being defiled and expect anything but his wrath and judgment. But he, by his spirit and by his power and by his divine authority and by his sovereign, glorious wisdom, made a way for us to enter into the holy place by his son, the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from every defilement, every sin, every entanglement of the world, where we, as a people, because we're under his authority and by his presence, can now enter in to his glory. We can enter in to the holy place. Because of what he has done for us, and being made clean, we can now come into the presence. So the, every Sabbath day, this bread will be taken away, and the, in, the frankincense that had been sitting on top of the piles of bread would be poured onto the altar of incense to burn as a fragrant aroma before the presence of the Lord. And this table was never empty, never empty. When the priests would come in, they would take one pile of six loaves, and they would pull it off, and they would empty the frankincense into the altar... And then they would bring the other new fresh bread and they would lay it there. And then they would take the old bread and the priest would eat it in a holy place outside the tabernacle. And then they would take the next bread of presence and they would pull it off. So fresh bread was continually and fresh wine was continually on the table before the presence of the Lord. And if you look at the name, the bread of presence, has been called many different things in the scriptures even. It's called the bread of presence. It's called the show bread. But if you look at the name, it's literally Bread of the face. Because the bread set always before the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. And there's a picture there. That the bread and the wine, which is not a New Testament com communion picture. It's an Old Testament picture from the beginning. Was that this bread, this meal would be set before the presence of the Lord for all times. As an invitation for those who might enter in to share in communion with him. To share in communion with him. When the priest would take the bread, that their portion, the priest's portion of the bread of the presence was five loaves. Well, when G Jesus says that when, when David came, he requested five loaves to eat. David's saying, I want the priestly portion for me and my men before we go. I love that imagery. The perfect golden table. The bread and the wine and the, and the frankincense, the incense that would be poured out before the Lord for a fragrant aroma. And you couldn't just enter that place. You had to first make atonement and be washed. Because Jesus 
is our Passover lamb. Church, when I talked last week, my concern sometimes in sharing the testimony of how the Lord speaks is I don't ever want it to be perceived that when the Lord speaks, it's a simple or a trite thing, you know, because it's not that way at all. The fact that we, it's been given to us to hear from the Lord is a heavenly, holy, heavy thing. And, and, it's, and it, he does it on purpose, and every word that the Lord uses is measured. It's, it's so intentional because he's wanting to use it to do something. And the concept that Jesus is saying in this passage is, do you realize that I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, and I can give you what's restricted? I can let you enter into the holy place to participate in the communion of my presence. Because the table represents a place When we sit around and we eat together, there's conversation that happens that can't happen anywhere else because for the first time, we're seated together, we're face to face. And Jesus is saying, do do you not know when David was hungry that they eat the bread of the presence? And I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, and my disciples are now eating on the Sabbath. They're plucking grain because I've given it to them to eat because we share fellowship together. And when they entered into my rest... They entered in to receiving the things that were at one time restricted or out of bounds. See, that bread never gets old. Changed out every Sabbath day, but you start to recognize Jesus is not calling us to eat the old bread. He's not calling us to eat the old bread. He's not even saying you are relegated to the priest's portion. I'm inviting you in to eat the fresh bread. Father, give us new life. Father, give us new bread. Give us new bread. Give us, Father, bread, new bread. From the table before your presence, give us new wine. You know, this past um, fall, when the elders and the staff went on the retreat, we spent quite a bit of time seeking the Lord for new life and asking the Lord, like, Lord, what, what do you want to say to new life as a church for this next year? And there was a common theme that came up in our prayer time. It's, it's amazing. I love, and you, I would encourage you guys to do this in the small groups or, or, or in your homes. Take time to seek the Lord. Take time to hear from Him and then come back together and discuss what it is you're perceiving hearing from the Lord. And the reason we do that is because it provides a safeguard for us. If we begin to hear things that are not from the Lord, they're from our own imagination or, or, or God forbid they're from the evil one. But he also is speaking, by the way. His voice sounds like uh, depression and anxiety and and fear. And the voice of the Lord may say some things that are fearful, but you feel a sense of peace in it. And so when when we're able to come together and say, hey, these are the things I'm sensing from the Lord. And we have others that are around us that are going, "I, I heard almost word for word the exact same thing. It's confirmation that the Lord's in our midst and that he's speaking. But it also provides for us. Uh, a guard against, if we hear something that's not from the Lord, somebody can go, hey, I, I really think that wasn't from the Lord. Like, and I'm not trying to downgrade your hearing or anything. I'm just saying, I'm not, you may want to just check what you feel like you heard. And it's a protection for us. That's why the Lord didn't call us to hear individually alone. It was, the Lord called us to hear individually for the corporate body and corporately to hear together. And so, uh, at the staff and elders retreat, we, we all kind of separated as couples, and we began to seek the Lord. And we were like, Lord, what do you want to say to us for new life? And what was amazing was there, was a consistent, there were consistent themes that came out over and over and over again. And one of those consistent themes was new wine. New wine. And so we began to sing that song in January of this year. In, in a sense, if you, can, if you can take this, in a sense, as a prophetic statement, Lord, give us new wine. As a church. But back in the fall, we had no clue what, what the Lord, what was in the heart of the Lord for this coming year for new life. We had no clue about COVID or what storms may come or that we would be looking for a new pastor or we, we, we didn't know any of that thing. We didn't know any of those things, but we knew, Lord, please give us new wine and new bread. But how many of you know in order to get new wine, there's a crushing? How many of you know that in order to get new bread, it has to go through an oven? You don't get new bread and new wine without heat and without crushing. 
And not only that, but there has to be preparation made for the receiving of those things as a whole anyway. But I have good news. In that furnace and in that crushing, we can abide in the presence. In that oven and in that crushing, we can abide in the presence. We can remain in the holy place. And we can hear from Him. We can experience His presence. And it's necessary to endure. <clears throat> it's necessary to endure the crushing. It's necessary to endure the furnace. We have to remain in His presence. So here's the invitation this morning. Who is hungry? If you're hungry, you can come and eat. But there's a prerequisite to the communion. And that prerequisite is hunger. How many of you here this morning would say, with a whole heart, God, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I need you. I need to partake of the communion that's set before your presence. I'm hungry. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 21. Get a picture of this. <clears throat> it says, now then, what do you have on hand? This is David speaking. Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered, <clears throat> I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread. If the young men have kept themselves from women, and David answered the priest, Truly women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy even when it is an ordinary journey. So David comes to the tabernacle. He's actually running for his life from, from, from King Saul. And he asks the priest, Abiathar, he says, can I, can I have the priest portion of the bread? Now, just so you know, that's only something that the priest can eat. But the priest says, I'm going to make an uh, uh, opportunity for you to have this, even though you're not supposed to, because I recognize the authority that's been put on you, because you're not just any Joe Blow, you're the king. The, the anointing oil of the king rests on your head, and therefore, if you're requiring of me the priestly portion of the bread, you can have it only this. You can't have the bread unless you're holy. And in the Old Testament, there were restrictions put around holiness. And one of those restrictions was around sexual contact. Because in the Old Testament, sexual contact had a defiling aspect to it. It doesn't mean that it's sinful. It certainly can be sinful. But even within the context of marriage, sex was seen as something that would defile your flesh. And there was a cleansing period for it. And you may be like, well, defiling, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it was the same if you touched blood or a dead body. Those things aren't evil or, or, or wrong. They certainly can be. But the point being that when you engage in some of those acts or in, in some of those things, it has a tendency to defile you because it makes you unlike the Lord is. And the Lord's not engaging in sexual uh, activity, and so it makes you unlike he is, but it doesn't mean it's sinful. Does that make sense? But, but the priest wants to make sure that David and his men have not undergone any form of defilement in order to partake of the holy bread. Because whatever that bread would touch would make that thing holy. And that's why the priest, only the priest could eat it, and only in the right garments and only in the right place. It was very, very important that this, this thing that was holy not touch anything that was defiled. And David goes, look, even when we go on an ordinary journey, we make sure that we're undefiled. So right now you better believe on this important journey that we have not done in any way any, any sense of thing that could have brought defilement on us. But David is willing to take the priest's portion. He says, he says, give me five loaves or whatever you have, but really David knows what he's asking for. He said, I want the five loaves. Is there anywhere else in Scripture you know where five loaves were used? Jesus is standing before a crowd of 5,000. Again, he says, the people are hungry. The people are hungry. And I don't want them to leave hungry or they'll faint on the way because they've been with me for a little while. Do we have anything? And his disciples are like, well, we, we have a couple fish and five loaves. You know, what do you want us to do with that? And Jesus goes, oh, five loaves, huh? That'll be perfect because that's the priest's portion and it's perfect for those that are hungry. And you know that when they, when they gather the gatherings together of what's left over after the people are eaten, it's 12 baskets. And I'm here to tell you this morning, it's not 12 baskets because there were 12 disciples. It's 12 baskets because there was 12 pieces of bread on the table. Jesus is making a statement to anyone who understood the law. I am the priest's portion. 
And if you can eat my flesh and drink my blood in the presence of the Father, it's going to do something that's going to impact the world. And all I need to feed 5,000 is five loaves because that priest's portion is enough to feed the entire world. It never, ever, ever runs out. And I turn five into 12. That's how my math works. And there's nothing that will stop you when you have eaten of that portion. Nothing. So enjoy the presence. He gives us of his presence to transform us into his image. He gives us of his presence to transform us into his image. David says, he says, my men are already holy. But then he says this, how much more today will their vessels be holy? He's saying, they're already undefiled. But when they eat this bread, they're really going to be holy. So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day when it's taken away. You see, the Lord is speaking to us. He's giving to us of his presence. He's inviting us into the holy place to participate because he wants to make us like he is. And that is the purpose for which the Lord speaks to us as a people. Individually and as a body corporately, he speaks because every word that the Lord speaks has a transformative aspect and a creative aspect that when it hits our heart, does something that produces in us his own likeness. Do you understand if you eat the bread and wine, that the bread and wine is the body and the blood of Jesus? And it's actually an invitation to become as he is. Take this body, take this blood, and allow it to transform you from the inside out. So enter into my presence and participate with me in this imagery. So when the Lord speaks, it's bread and wine to our spirit. And it's transformative. Because the language of the Lord is reality. Every word that the Lord speaks is measured perfectly. And is accomplishing exactly whatever it is that the Lord wanted it to accomplish. So when the Lord speaks... It creates whatever it is he wants to create. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. So we have the picture in the beginning of creation where, where it says that there was darkness over the face of the... The, the, the Lord created the heavens and the earth and there was darkness over the face of the earth and there was, it, was, it was chaotic and there was a void. And, and we see the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters and it's this, this imagery that, like, of darkness and, and, and turmoil and, and chaos... And then the scriptures, if we read them in Genesis, it says, let there be light. But that's actually not perfectly what the Lord said. It says, really, be light. Be light. He didn't say, let there be light. See, when the Lord speaks, whatever he speaks is created instantaneously. If God says, table, a table just appears. It's not like, it's not like he has to form it. It's like his language is a language that is, becomes reality because in the vibrations that proceed out of his mouth is a creative essence. And whatever issues forth from his lips becomes reality. And so some of you have been twisting and turning in chaos and malevolence and struggle and turmoil. And God is in a sense right now clearing his throat to go, be light. <laughs> Come alive. Life. And all of a sudden life comes to be in your heart or you're struggling with the situation and the Lord is just in your heart whispering peace peace and when he says it it's initiated in our heart we feel it fill our being you know yes, or we're in the midst of suffering and turmoil and the Lord goes joy <laughs> be joy and something happens in us that we can't describe because there's no way according to our circumstance that we should have joy a few summers ago, we were, we were in a season, and the Lord's had us. I've told you our story, how the Lord's called us to walk by faith. A few summers ago, we were in a season where it was dry. And I mean dry like we weren't experiencing a lot from the Lord. And there are seasons where the Lord is quiet, and it's, it's a wilderness season. It's like a desert, but every now and then you see a stream start to break forth. But we weren't, we weren't just dry as far as experiencing the presence of the Lord. Everything in our, in our house was tearing up and breaking and we, we were in a season, there's been seasons where we had abundance. And we were in a season financially where we had nothing. And I think in that season, 
We had not had a dollar, a dollar in our house in like 10 days. And it hasn't always been that way, but sometimes it is. And the Lord is using everything to teach us. And we made a commitment to the Lord when he first asked us to walk by faith. We will never make a need known to man, but we will make our need known to you. And you, by your spirit, will speak to somebody in your body to make provision for us. And we've operated, and so we know, Lord, we've operated in that way so that we know that whatever we have in every moment will be from you. And so if we have abundance, we'll know it's for purpose. If we have lack, we'll know that you're doing something and teaching us something. It's on purpose. And this season in particular, we, we, we had not had a dollar in, 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 in days. And we still had food in the cabinet, and so we, we were, you know, and I had a friend of mine say, hey, can you help me and my family move to Wisconsin? And I said, sure, man, I, I can do that. And so... On top of all that, our cars, both of our cars were completely on empty. And I remember praying before I was going to leave my family at the house with nothing, which I, I would not encourage anybody to do unless you know that the Lord's asked you to do that. I just said, Lord, I would really appreciate if you would provide for my family before I leave. This is what I felt that the Lord said to me. Noted. <laughs> <laughs> It's measured, right? As soon as I heard the Lord say that, I knew he was not going to provide for my family before I left. And I said to the Lord, I will go even if you don't provide, but I want you to provide. Noted. <laughs> okay, Lord. Okay, I'm going. If, for, no, for another reason, but by, for spite now, I'm going. So, we, I, I, I go on the trip, and the day that I leave, both of our cars are empty. We don't have a dollar, and we literally have rice left and coconut oil, I think, and chocolate chips. <laughs> That's what we had in our house. And I get, in the, I get in this moving van, headed up to Wisconsin, and I'm like, Lord, I will not eat until you provide for my family. Hunger strike time. And the Lord says, no, you're going to eat every meal that's put in front of you because it will be a blessing for him to provide for you. Because when you are by faith, all those that it puts, the Lord puts it in their heart to make provision for you, it's because it's actually in his heart to bless them. The Lord told Abraham, everyone who blesses you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. So when you walk according to the family tradition, everyone that the Lord puts it in their heart to bless you, the Lord actually has it in their heart to bless them. So the Lord said, you're going to eat every meal that's put in front of you. And I'm like, well, Lord, my family's at home eating rice. He's like, I'm providing for them, aren't I? aren't I? I want you to eat. So we stopped for lunch at this really nice restaurant, and I'm eating a Monte Cristo sandwich. <laughs> and we stopped for dinner in Chicago and have Giordano's deep dish pizza. Have you ever had it? When you cut the pizza, I'm not kidding. If you listen closely, you'll hear angels sing as the steam comes out. It's like, a, it's like a fragrant aroma before the Lord that goes up. I'm literally eating the pizza thinking, my family's eating rice right now. This went on several days, and every day I'm calling Holly, did anything happen today? Did anything happen? Did we get anything today? Did we get anything today? And she tells me, we haven't gotten anything except I figured out a way to make chocolate chip cookies with the coconut oil and the, um, and the, the chocolate chips and a little bit of flour that I found. And she said, the Lord's just been speaking to me about joy about joy and, and not having joy in our circumstance or what, not having joy in what we put in our mouth because I don't know if you realize, when you, you find a lot of satisfaction by flavor and when you don't have it, you start to realize how much of your satisfaction is based on your circumstance. And how will the Lord teach you to have joy in Him without having to walk through trial and struggle and find joy in Him in the midst of a circumstance that should not provide you any joy or any satisfaction? And so Holly tells me, we literally have been dancing around the kitchen over these cookies because the Lord's just filling our heart with joy. He's speaking joy in our heart. And we're dancing around the kitchen about to eat these cookies. <laughs> and I began to cry on the phone saying, Lord, what are you doing? Like, this is amazing. Thank you for just noting that I wanted provision and not doing it. And that night, I prayed to the Lord, and I felt the Lord said, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for your family? And I said, Lord, I have two, two answers. One answer is, I want you to keep doing what you've been doing. 
no matter what it costs. Because I can't manufacture joy in my kid's heart. They have to experience that by your presence. And if it drives us to nothing, but we have joy, give us nothing. If we have to have peace and struggle, give us struggle. My second answer is unlike the first, not totally disconnected, but I feel like I just need to say it. Will you provide for us? Will you provide for my family to have food to eat? And the Lord said, I said, but I want you to do the first more than I want you to do the second. And the Lord said this, I can do both. I can do both. I can keep providing for your family, and I can keep doing what I'm doing in your heart. Because I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, and I can invite you into the places that were out of bounds and cut off. But by my blood, I can invite you into the holy place to experience my presence and have communion. And know that whatever I want to speak to you will do something in your heart that will radically transform you because I speak reality. And when I say joy, you have joy, and your circumstance cannot stand against it. It can't. So if the world falls down around us, church... He's given us his presence to transform us into his image. We've got everything going on around us. And in the days ahead, as the world intensifies in trouble and burden and hardship, if we react in the same way that the world does, we have no good news to offer them. If our economy collapses or dark days are ahead or we descend into conflict internally, And we react the way that the world does. We have nothing to offer them. But if in the midst of that turmoil and strife and trouble, the Lord speaks into our hearts joy or peace or love, all of a sudden we have very fertile ground for a massive, massive work of the Lord. Because the world around us will begin to see that there's something different about us. And they'll say, what is it? And we'll say, we ate the bread of the presence. Because the Lord of the Sabbath made a way for us to enter into. And why has he done that for us? Why has he done that? Because he didn't have to. Why has he? It's this reason. Because it's always been in his heart to show us mercy. It's always been in his heart to show us mercy. Hosea 6 says this. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And my judgment goes forth as light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. He's saying, it's not been in my heart to have sacrifice. I did it because you won't choose me. And you need a way to be clean where you can enter in. But my heart has always been in re- to have a relationship with you. He tells Samuel in the Old Testament, have I desired burnt offering and sacrifice? Or that you would listen and obey? I, d- I didn't want there to be sacrifice and bloodshed. But there has to be because you're not clean. What I always wanted was a loving relationship. When I began to look at this Matthew 6 passage, I, I remember this same story is in a couple other Gospels. And I looked at the one in Matthew, and, Ma- and Jesus echoes Hosea and Samuel. And this is where we're going to close this morning. In Matthew 12, this is what it says. He, said, he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. (laughs) Yeah, it is. (laughs) And if you had known what this means, listen to this, church. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. You see, His mercy is the connecting point between his steadfast love and his kindness and his desire to help us. His mercy is the connecting point between his steadfast love and kindness and his desire to help us. It's where they meet. And we call that mercy. Because he's reached down and he's made a way for us into the holy places so that we can experience His presence and commune with Him, so that that presence and every word that He speaks to us would transform our hearts. Transform our hearts. For what purpose? That His mercy would usher forth out of us 
to those that are around us. First, to accomplish something in us, and then to accomplish something in the world around us. And James says, do you not know that mercy triumphs over judgment? Mercy triumphs over judgment. And that mercy has been granted to us. Would you bow your heads this morning? Mercy is extended to you. A way has been made for you. Jesus said, I am the doorway. No one comes into the presence of the Father except through me. If you're here this morning, you've not experienced the presence, I want you to know there's a way. There's a way in, and it will be transformative for your entire life as he speaks words of life and truth and joy and peace into your heart. If you're here this morning and you never received it, but you, you know that the Lord's drawing you in, will you raise your hand? If you're here this morning, you go, Robert, I need, I need the presence. I need it. I need that joy. I need that peace. I need to hear in my heart what he wants to speak. I'm struggling right now. Would you raise your hand? Yeah. Yeah. Father, we don't even know how desperate we are for you. We have an inclination, Lord. We have an inclination how much we need your presence. Will you speak to us? Right now, Lord, in this moment, would you allow your words to penetrate, to accomplish in us what you want to accomplish? Father, don't let a religious mind with rules and regulations prevent us from entering into the holy place to have fresh bread and fresh wine. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.